in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The labor of all church workers shall never be in vain as our Father, the Father of all globally, the convener of GCK, Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumui gives us the Global Church Workers Conference live from Taraba State, Nigeria. All church workers and ministers globally to join hands with all ministers across Taraba State, Northern Nigeria from 17 to 20 November 2022. It's our time for triumphing in ministry, even in troublous times. Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumui will be ministering 8 a.m. daily from Jalingo, Taraba State, to the world, brass satellites, and on all our social media platforms. It will be an avalanche of global expositions and revelations. Your labor will not be in vain. When we started the year 2022, you had hopes, you had desires, you had dreams, but suddenly, all over the globe, we read and hear of failures economically, politically, with climate change and security breaches here and there. And now, I hear a voice echoing towards the northeastern geopolitical zone of Nigeria. Now, I hear a voice echoing towards the northeastern geopolitical zone of Nigeria. Today, the Lord is saying, weep not. All your tears are dried, because behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed. And it's confirmed that there's still one hope, one way, one solution, and one power that never fails. The power of Jesus Christ reverberates this November with GCK live from Adamawa State, Nigeria. The land of beauty set to beautify your life through Christ. As the covenant of GCK, Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumui will touch down in Adamawa, Nigeria with a power that never fails. Healing, deliverance, salvation. November 24 to 29, 2022. 1600 hours GMT daily and 0700 hours GMT for Sunday worship service. Young people from all levels will be empowered for excellence at the Impact Academy on November 26, 2022 at 0600 hours GMT. Ministers and professionals will be empowered for breakthrough in ministry on November 25, 26, 28, and 29 at 0600 hours GMT. Our guest gospel minister is Bob Feets. This is an avalanche of manifestation of the power that never fails for all life. Power will herald your celebration. Dr. William Kumui says, Be it confirmed in your life in Jesus' name. GCK, the gospel to every creature. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be called your own children. Not just that we're children, you have also involved us in the work of the kingdom. And this is a special area of the work. You want the gospel to be preached to every creature. And we have these creatures that are negligent of righteousness negligent of the divine call upon their lives on the campuses and you are calling us to arise and do something therefore lord we pray that heavenly fire from the throne of the almighty god will fall upon every heart even from tonight in jesus name we know that we are well able the devil will say we cannot the flesh will say we cannot our own self timidity will say we cannot people around us will say we cannot circumstances will say we cannot but we hear the voice of the father from heaven we listen to the whisper of the spirit from within 
and we're hearing our beloved Lord on the throne, Jesus Christ saying, we are well able. And so Lord, tonight we pray that all we need to have, all we need to know, you give unto us so that your will will be done in our lives in Jesus name. I pray, oh Lord, for every brother here, every sister here, that, Lord, whatever is missing in our heart, in our lives, in our experiences, that has not made us to rise up like giants that we are, you supply to every one of us in Jesus' name, so that we that you have called, we that you have chosen, we that you have energized and empowered, will arise and get the work done in Jesus' name. We we'll pray, Lord, that from now on, the seemingly impossible will become possible. And you help every one of us to attempt incredible things. And we know that we'll accomplish, we'll achieve what your purpose for every one of us to achieve in your work, in your kingdom, in Jesus' name. Speak to every one of us tonight. As we hear, help us that we may understand. And that the word will mix with faith in every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. So that the weak will be able to say, I am strong. We will be strong in the strength of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. I welcome every one of you to the meeting we're starting tonight, which is a Campus Workers Retreat. And I believe that as you come, the Lord himself will touch your life and touch your heart from the very beginning in Jesus' name. You'll see from the program that tonight we're talking on the sleeping giant. Wake up. It's a very terrible situation when giants sleep. When giants sleep, weak, innocent people are going to suffer. When giants sleep, many will be kept in the captivity and slavery of the devil. When giants sleep, Lost sinners are going to die without finding the way back to the Father's home. When giants sleep, hardened sinners destroy themselves and destroy others. When giants sleep, Christian pilgrims are likely to, are likely to wander for a long time in the wilderness. When giants sleep, Many people are going to be kept away from the land of promise because of the Red Sea that nobody is able to divide. When giants sleep, the poor in spirit, that is, those who are poor spiritually, are going to remain poor. And even the people that have any kind of spiritual life, they're going to wander and wither and dry up, eventually perhaps backslide and die. When giants sleep, it's very likely that there'll be nobody courageous and bold enough to move around and go around the walls of Jericho. So then the walls of Jericho will keep out the believers who want to enter and will keep in the unbelievers or in the cage, in the captivity of the devil. When giants sleep, Goliaths will be bragging and blaspheming the name of the Lord, and nobody will be able to arise and challenge him. When giants sleep, the people of God will remain in Babylon without ever having any deliverer to bring them out. When giants sleep, everything goes now. There's no life, no revival, no renewal. But if the giants can wake up, there will be a change, there will be a transformation, not only in a local assembly, but there will be a change and transformation in the heart, 
in his surrounding and also among the people that do not know the Lord. That's why I believe it's very important that we look at what the word of God has to say to wake up the sleeping giant. The word giant appears in a number of places in the Bible. But for our own purposes, to get into what the word of God has to say, let's look at Numbers chapter 13, verse 33. Numbers 13, 33. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Enoch, which came of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so were we in their sight. We find here the children of Israel who had seen the miracle working power of God in the land of Egypt. Here we find the children of Israel who had already seen the defeat of Pharaoh and his chariots. Here we find the children of Israel who had been drinking miraculous water. And also they had been eating the miracle food from heaven. Here we find the children of Israel who had known of the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. Here we find the children of Israel who had been very familiar with the supernatural, with the extraordinary. But then they didn't understand their peculiar position, their peculiar calling. They had sent out 12 elders of the land. And they had gone to spy out the land of Canaan. These 12 had come back. And as they came back, they brought the fruit of the land. And they were able to say, truly, the land is flowing with milk and honey. Only one problem. Ten of them said they saw giants there. And they said they were in their own sight, and they felt in the sight of the other people too, they were like grasshoppers. Meaning that the unbelievers were stronger, were greater. They were so terrific that they felt that they were like grasshoppers, and these some believers like giants are going to tread on them, crush them, destroy them, forget about them. But then Caleb said in verse 30, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once. This is the hour, Caleb said. This is the time, Caleb said. This is the decisive moment, Caleb said. Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the others, the ten, they said, no, it's impossible. Why did they say it's impossible? We need to discover this from scripture. And if you read your scriptures very well, this may come to you as a surprise and as a shock. And that gives me my point number one, the paradox of our identity. The paradox of our identity. Then we'll move to number two, the exploits of God's awakened giants. The exploits of God's awakened giants. Number three, possession of Satan's stronghold for our king. Possession of Satan's stronghold for our king. Obviously. When giants wake up, will do exploits for the Lord. Obviously, when the giants wake up, we're going to possess the places that the devil is keeping at present as a stronghold. We're going to possess all those places for our king. But then, go back to point number one. Let's clear up. The paradox of our identity. You see these uh, children of Israel, the elders representing the people of Israel. They had gone to the land and they had seen the people. As they looked at themselves, they felt they were like grasshoppers. 
As they looked at the unbelievers, the people that didn't have any covenant with God, they felt those people that didn't have any covenant, they were like giants. And that introduces already a paradox to the people of God. And that is what I find in many pages of scripture. Time will fail me to go through with you and tell you the paradox I see in the identity of the people of God. And actually, we could just take what they said as even the paradox of their identity. That actually, they looked like grasshoppers, inexperienced, very weak. Anyone could crush and destroy them. And yet, they were appointed by God to overcome. The paradox is, it was really the grasshopper that was expected to become the giant and destroy the giants. As I look at the identity of the believer, I must look at the identity first of the captain of our salvation, the identity of our Savior and Lord, the identity of Jesus Christ himself. And you will discover this paradox already in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, reading from verse 2. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book neither to look thereon. And I, John, telling us his testimony, and I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders says unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion, underline that in your Bible, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, if you are John, you'll be looking for that lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Here is the paradox. Verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. The lamb is the lion, the paradox of our identity. You see, many times there are many people that will think if we are going to really be like the lion, powerful, mighty, fearless, never turning aside for anyone, purposing it, accomplishing it, knowing that this what is what God has called us for and we're going to accomplish, they think that we're just going to look like lion to everybody else. But then when the elder said, don't worry and don't weep, John, because the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to take the book and to open the seals thereof. And as John looked, he saw not a lion, but he saw the lamb. Yet, it is that lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world that is the real lion. What we find in the Savior, we find in ourselves. What we find in the captain of our salvation, we find in ourselves. And it is a paradox of the identity of the believer. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 11. Matthew 11, verse 11. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women... There has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, 
he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Again, the paradox here. And many people never unravel, never understand, never appropriate the paradox we're talking about here. Jesus Christ said, the least in the kingdom, the least brother, the least sister, is actually greater than John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is greater than all the people that lived before him. I'm here to see quite a number of believers that will appropriate the identity of the believer there because it means that we're greater than Moses, greater than Elijah, the prophet of fire, who single-handedly brought fire from heaven to the altar of sacrifice and destroyed all those prophets of Baal. And to think that the least convert in the kingdom the least follower of the Lord Jesus Christ is greater than John the Baptist and John the Baptist greater than he is almost unthinkable to many of the believers. It's unconventional to think like that. And yet this is exactly what we need to understand the paradox of our identity. In fact, Jesus Christ explained this. You see many theologians, they will say, oh yes, the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist, and John is greater than all the rest. And you know the various interpretations they give to that. They say, well, all those people prophesied about Christ, and they never saw him. But John the Baptist saw him. In that way, he was greater than John the Baptist. Uh, sorry, John the Baptist was greater than all the rest of the people. But then you know that we believers today were on this side of the cross. Christ is dead already. He has accomplished the salvation for us. In that way, we are all greater than John the Baptist. That is true, but it goes beyond that. Jesus Christ said, He that believeth in me, the works I do, he shall do. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. And many believers, they just bypass that verse of Scripture. They are not willing to explore that Scripture, because to them, they can't imagine it. They can't think about it. They cannot believe it, that as weak as they are, as... Uh, on touch as they are that they will be able to do the works of Jesus Christ and greater works than Jesus Christ did they will not even explore the very possibility in that way the least in the kingdom is greater than the greatest in the Old Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 reading from verse 25 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 25 the paradox of our identity. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. How do you understand that? The foolishness of God is stronger, greater than the wisdom of man. And the weakness of God is stronger, greater than the strongest of all men. You see, the Corinthians had mixed so much with the Greeks. And if you have studied about the Greeks, the Greeks were philosophers. All the philosophies you are studying about today in your universities, those Greek people were the foundation of all those things. And in Corinth, they discovered that even the people that came to church, they had this philosophy and this philosophy. And you find this one in this school of thought and that one in this school of thought. And eventually, Paul the Apostle came to them. And Paul the Apostle was saying, Corinthian believers, I see that you are divided. You are divided not just because of Christianity or because of doctrine. You are divided because of a lot of philosophies around you. And then he told them, 
he said the Greeks are looking, running after wisdom. And then the Jews are running after another thing, signs and wonders. Then he came to them, he said, do you know something? You don't need to argue about philosophy. All those philosophers, and when you think of philosophy, you are thinking of the wisdom of men. You are thinking of the ideologies of men. You are thinking of all the theories they are propounding. We think this is the reason for the foundation of the world, for the creation of the world, and for the reason of existence, and for this and for that. So Paul the Apostle said, Do you know, Corinthians, the most foolish of you, which to the Gentiles represent the foolishness of God, is wiser than the wisest of men. I don't think the Corinthians could understand that. And he was also telling them, the weakest of you, if we could think of and talk of the weakness of God, the weakness of God is stronger than men. And then he said, let me even tell you, one of the proofs of that, he said, do you know that God has decided that by the foolishness of preaching, he will save the people that believe. He was telling them, look at all the schools of thought, look at all the philosophies, and look at all the theories they have. With all those theories, none of them by their philosophy could get saved. And yet, the preaching of the cross, which is a stumbling block to the Jew, and it is foolishness to the Greeks, it is that foolishness of the preaching of the cross that has brought salvation unto you. When you think about it, you then understand that although we might appear to be the foolish people, we might appear to be the weak people, and yet if we were the foolishness of God, and the people will say religion is a foolish thing, well, let's even take them for their word. And let us think that all of us here, the people of the world, because we believe in Christ, because we believe the cross of Jesus Christ, because we believe in heaven, because we believe that by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're escaping hell. Let us even accept the use of their word, that because of that, we are foolish. So we have become the foolishness of God. In our foolishness, we are wiser than the rich people of the world. What shall it profit them? If they gain the whole world, and they lose their souls, we have made a choice in our foolishness that the wisest of men in the world have not made, has not made. And so you understand that the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. In verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world. To confound the wise. You see what God has done? Here is the paradox. Would our universities choose the foolish people to come and teach and lecture the intelligent people? They wouldn't do that. But that's what God has done. He has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the people that are wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the ones that are strong and mighty. The paradox of our identity. You know, there are many times you feel weak. That's the paradox. In your, at your weakest point, you are strongest. The weak believer can deal with the devil. It's a paradox. And you take it by faith. And it is the way God works. The most foolish of us, believers, we can confound the people that are wise in the world. And the most foolish of all preaching can bring the wisest and the most intelligent and the most read in society, can bring them to know the Lord. Then in Isaiah chapter 41, Isaiah chapter 41, Reading from verse 14. Here again, we see the method that God uses in walking. In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 14. Fear not, thou warm Jacob, and ye men of Israel, 
I will help thee, says the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Stop there for a moment. Fear not, thou warm Jacob. What else could you show to illustrate the weakness, the vulnerability, and the possibility of being easily destroyed? How can you, more, how can you illustrate it more? Fear not, thou warm Jacob. You see, the worm is very, very different from the snake, the serpent. If you attack a snake, that snake will try to attack you back. Although both of them are crawling on the ground, the worm and the snake, the snake is very cunning. And the snake will be very destructive. And the poison from the stray, snake will kill just like that. But the worm is harmless, not protected. Just cr a little child crushing that thing, it's gone. And yet, look at this from verse 15 and verse 16. It says, Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. That's the paradox of identity. Warm, look at that thing. Helpless, useless. It's not a terror to anyone. Cannot harm anyone or anything except quietly eating up the plants. And Jacob was compared to that on his own as warm. There was nothing Jacob could do to all the nations around that wanted to destroy Jacob or Israel. Because all you could call Jacob, Israel, was that it just warm. But then it says, behold, look at this. Think about this. Meditate on this one. Behold, see what I'm going to do. And see the paradox of your identity. I will make thee warm, a new sharp threshing instrument, having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains, and beat them small, and shall also make the hills as chaff. And then it goes on talking about what God will do. Looking at that thing ordinarily. You will say this one can never accomplish anything. Looking at yourself ordinarily. That's what you say. Oh, you say, I just like to come to fellowship and believe the word of God. And just getting saved. I think God has been so wonderfully kind to me. So fearful so weak, so unintelligent. What other people understand, it takes me much time before I can understand. So forgetful. What can I do in the kingdom of God? All I think I can do is to just crawl in there, rest in, what, in one corner there, and be praying for the people that are strong, that are going to do the work for God. As for me, see what I am. That's a paradox. That's what the children of Israel felt when those ten, when they came back from the promised land. And then they said, we are just like grasshoppers. If they had known that those grasshoppers were to possess the land of the giants. It's a paradox. It's always like that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 10. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. You know who they are talking about? The one that wrote more than half of the New Testament. You know who they are talking about? They are talking about the one that went on the three missionary journeys. You know who they are talking about? The one that rose up and said, an angel appeared to me tonight and told me that all the people that are with me, he has saved them. None of them will perish in the sea. And I believe God, it shall be so even as it has been told me. You know who the Bible is talking about here? That he said, his bodily presence is weak 
and his speech contemptible. They were talking about a person that God said, he is a chosen vessel unto me. He will take my name to the Gentiles and to the kings and to the people of Israel. And here is the paradox. His letters are witty. His messages are powerful. And although the man Paul, the apostle, although he is dead and was dead many years ago, almost 2,000 years, his letters are still weighty today. You read those letters, you know that God used that man. What are we learning them from our identity? This will help us to understand that it's time for us to wake up. We have been thinking that we are grasshoppers, but you have already discovered from the Bible that the homeless wanderers in the wilderness became the powerful warriors in the land of Canaan. When they were wandering about in the wilderness, nobody thought that they would be able to amount to anything. Nobody thought that they would be able to remain a nation. Can I tell you something? All those seven nations mightier than Israel at the time of Moses, we do not know anything about them today except in archaeology. When these archaeologists go up to dig up the ruins of the ancient cities, then they dig up some of those things and they try to read some of the old writings. Then they say these are the relics of the people that died many years ago. But you know the children of Israel, those grasshoppers, those homeless wanderers, they are settled still now in the land of Canaan. Don't you think about the powerful city Babylon? Where is it today? The powerful cities, Ephesus, where is it today? All those powerful cities you read about in the Old Testament, where are they today? But the Jerusalem you read about in the Old Testament is still there today. The people of Israel you read about in the Old Testament and New Testament, they are still there today. You know why? Those homeless wanderers, the people that you felt will not make it in life because of the power of God, because of the paradox of our identity. They are the powerful, mighty warriors. They are still there today. Not only that, the lamb becomes the lion. You know Jesus Christ, how they dragged him about, how they betrayed him, how they smote him, just the lamb. And yet, next time, you see him break the heavens open. And he's coming back with 10,000 times 10,000 of his saints. And he's going to rule with a rod of iron. The lamb is the lion. Not only that, the least is the greatest. Least, when you think of them in the kingdom of God, as a little child, as if they cannot accomplish or do anything. And yet, when you think about it, they are the instruments of bringing people away from the hands of the devil to the hands of the Savior. Not only that, people like Paul, weak in appearance. And yet, the paradox is that the people that are weak in appearance are the people that have strong ministry. I read to you from Isaiah 41. The worm is the one that is a sharp, threshing instrument. Not only that, the fearful. Did you hear what Moses said when God called him? Very, very fearful. Oh Lord, send who you will send. I cannot do anything. I cannot accomplish anything. I am a stammerer. I am a man of uncircumcised leaves. The fearful. But see him later before Pharaoh. He was the fourth forceful, fiery, prophet, mighty man of God. Fearful when we first saw him. Fearful when he received the call. And yet, when he answered that call, the paradox of it is that the fearful one we saw at the backside of the desert is the one that we later discovered to be forceful and fiery. I read to you in the epistle to the Corinthians, the foolish is the wise. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. The harmless becomes the most dangerous to the devil's kingdom. See David coming, a youth. And Goliath thought, 
Why? The children of Israel are going to waste the life of this young fellow. Why have they sent this one unto me? This one that was apparently very weak and harmless. He was the one that took off the head of Goliath. Watch it. Those harmless believers, very quiet believers, that you think we can't tell him to lead Bible study, he wouldn't even know how to talk. We can't tell him to lead prayer meeting. He wouldn't even know how to communicate his mind to the people. He's so quiet, so silent, and he, he, he never can even express himself. Put him there and see the paradox of our identity. Because that seemingly harmless individual is very dangerous to the kingdom of the devil. Not only that, is the child that became the champion. The child, the one that you will think, this one is not experienced. In fact, Saul said, little boy, you are just a lad. That Goliath you see there has been a warrior from his youth. You cannot do it. And then the child began to give some testimonies of the mighty power of God. It was a child that became the champion. Let's travel a little bit to Babylon. And let us get to the captives of the house of Judah. I'm talking about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The captive became the leader. You remember how they chose them to learn the tongue, the language of the Chaldeans. And also they should be understanding in science and other things like that. And then eventually, you know when they reported Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they told Nebuchadnezzar, they said, these people, they do not regard you. These captives, slaves, that have come from the land of Israel. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, of all people, even if anybody was going to disobey my order, it will be people that have title and the people that have personality. Not to talk of slaves for that matter. And then he called them and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you will change your mind, know that you have no consequence and you have nobody here. You are in non-entity here. If you will change your mind and bow down to my idol, that will be wonderful. You will save your life. But if you slaves... If you will go against my word and you will say you are not going to bow down, tell me, who is that God? He couldn't say, who is your father? Father was not there. He couldn't say, who is the king? He was the emperor of the whole earth. The only personality he could refer to, apparently, that he felt could be greater than himself, was God. But he said, that God is not here. I'm the one in charge here. Who is that God? And those captives said, what can we say? We're not careful to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. And if not, let it be known to you, O king. We're not going to bow down to your idol. Then he commanded the strong men in his kingdom. This is a paradox. It's a strong man that bound the weak people that died. It's the weak people that were cast into the furnace of fire that lived. Is the paradox of our identity. And eventually when they cast them in there, Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, came down and met them there and fellowship with them. And then he called them out. You know what he called them? The servants of the Most High God. But they were captives before. They had nobody to defend them before. And eventually, he wrote to all the provinces, if anybody will speak against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Oh, I thank God for the paradox of identity. When I feel weak, then I am strong. When I feel foolish, then I am wise. You know, sometimes, you, if you have been preaching on your campuses, sometimes you will preach a message. And the devil will say, that is the worst message we ever listened to in the whole session. And true, true. That was the worst message. Weak, not pungent, not having content. 
and then when we meet somebody giving a testimony oh the fellow will say praise the lord i got saved when do you remember the day when so and so preached and when we had this particular message then you remember you remember it for its weakness for its lack of content for its lack of pungency and power and yet it was that weak message that brought this notorious sinner out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of our god if you knew very well and believed very well the paradox of our identity you will never worry about your weakness when you feel weak you'll say praise the lord something good is going to happen when you pray and it appears that do you think you are believing do you think that anything is going to happen you'll say praise the lord i know that when i feel like this is when the greatest is going to be accomplished for the kingdom of god let's move on now from the paradox of our identity to the exploits of god's awakened giants all these that i've shown you from the word of god is to show you that even if you feel like a lamb or like the least in the kingdom or like a harmless individual or a weak individual or you feel like you're just like a worm very fearful very timid or you feel foolish or you feel that you are just a child or you feel that you have no knowledge at all or you feel that it's like uh, you are just one of those uh, people shadrach meshach and abednego in the land of babylon yet understand that it is with such people that God will walk as walking with giants. Because actually, he looks at you like a giant. Time will fail me to read all the references that we have. Therefore, I will omit some of the references that I think you know very well. I just tell you. For Samuel chapter 17, verse 41 to verse 51. For Samuel chapter 17. 17 verse 41 to verse 51 that is the story of little david that came before goliath and then he did exploits and please remember now that goliath was not the real champion goliath was not the real giant goliath was not the real strong man this little boy weak inexperienced not even up to the age of the people to be chosen to go to war. That is a real giant. And he did exploit for the Lord in that he destroyed the champion of the enemies of God. Now, Second Samuel chapter 21. I read this to you because I don't think you are familiar with this reference. Do you know that there were four other giants? Goliath was only one. Now, when you read in your Bible that David went to the brooks and then he took five small stones, you wonder, why five? Because there was only one Goliath. And don't you know that Goliath was so tall and he had an armor bearer and he had a sword in his hand and he had everything to kill and destroy David, don't you know? If at the first sling of the stone he missed Goliath, he wasn't going to be able to use the rest for on Goliath because Goliath would just stretch his long hand and cut off his head. He knew by faith because he came in the name of the Lord that he was going to get him with one stone. And yet, how about the rest four stones? Let's look at it. In 2 Samuel chapter 21. 2 Samuel chapter 21, reading from verse 18. And it came to pass after this that there was war. There was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then she be shy. The that's difficult to pronounce, but you understand. And then it says it goes on there, and then talks about which was 
of the sons of the giants. And then he said, there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines. Then he mentioned some other names again and then slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. There was again yet, there was yet a battle in Gaz, where was a man of great stature that had on, that had on, hand, on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number. And he also was born of the giants. And when he defied Israel, then we're told that Jonathan, the son of Shimea, that the brother of David slew him. It appears prophetically. God was telling David, David might not know this in the natural because he just came from the bush where he was keeping a watch over the sheep. And eventually when he came and he said, there is one Goliath there, a giant. Instead of having only one stone, he chose five. And then he killed one, Goliath, waiting for the rest of the four. The four stones apparently did not do the job, but he was willing. Should they come, he would have finished them later in life. Later, when he came to the throne, all these other four giants came and they were all destroyed. If you start destroying the giants, that's the one they call giants in the world, you will realize that by the grace of God, the power, the strength, the knowledge of God will continue with you in life. And if you can start today, you will continue to destroy the giants of the land in Jesus' name. Now, in John chapter 20, just write that down because it's a familiar passage. John chapter 20, verse 19. The disciples of Jesus Christ have been very afraid of the Jews. Because of that, they were behind closed doors. These fearful people eventually saw the risen Christ. And when they saw him, he told them to wait in Jerusalem until they be endued with power from on high. Eventually, they were endued with power from on high. These fearful people, now Acts chapter 5 from verse 27 to verse 32. They called them. The council saw them and said, Did we not slightly charge you that you should not preach in this name? See, now you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and you intend to bring the man's blood upon us. They filled Jerusalem with the doctrine. That's Acts chapter 5 verse 28. And then, chapter 5, verse 29, Peter began to answer them. Peter, of all people, the weak, fearful one, the one that denied the Lord just some time ago, now very bold, and he was telling them that the Lord had appeared unto them and made them witnesses of these things, and they must declare what they had seen, because they ought to obey God rather than men. You see what had happened? They were now doing exploits for the Lord. Getting souls saved. Well, in fact, that is what Daniel tells us. In Daniel chapter 11 verse 32. Daniel chapter 11 verse 32. The latter part of verse 32. And the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. What kind of exploits? Now, on your own campuses, if you know the Lord, and I'm sure that if you are born again, you know the Lord. If you have been following on with the Lord, you know the Lord. And as you continue to know the Lord, I believe you are going to do exploits. In those same places where you have been weak, I'm very fearful. And going about, going your way, not wanting to preach the gospel to anyone you will subdue irreligious blasphemers. That's what David did. He subdued Goliath. Irreligious blasphemer. Defying the God of Israel. You know, when you become a real giant, oh yes, you'll still be of the same height. You still look young facially. You might even still have some peculiarities and characteristics that are normal and natural with you. And yet, even though 
in physically even though looking at you you appear ordinary yet there is living in you jesus christ the lion of the tribe of judah and you will be able to subdue irreligious blasphemers in jesus name not only that you will silence the enemies of the gospel your actions will shut them up your preaching will shut them up the conversions of the people that they never thought will ever get converted will shut their mouth you will silence the enemies of the gospel that's the exploits we're going to do not only that you will preach effectively to those you once feared that's what peter did he once feared all those people he even feared their daughters he feared the maid he feared the servants he feared everyone but now when the holy ghost came upon him even a shadow was healing sick people and then he was very bold silver and gold abiding on peter of all people peter the inconsistent one peter the timid fearful one now he could say right in front of the temple there silver and gold have i none but what i have i give unto you in the name of jesus christ of nazareth rise up and walk and it was so do you remember how many times the lord told them why did you doubt oh you of little faith did you remember when jesus was with them when he said where is your faith do you remember when they came to him and they said, Why could we not cast him out? But now, the boldness of faith, the authority of the believer, they have become giants in the Lord. Silver and gold have I none. What I have, he knew he had something. You will do it. Not only that, you will turn many to righteousness. Many to righteousness. You know, many people coming to know the Lord. Not to imagine. As we look at Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. That the apostles that were so fearful, fearful of the Jews, and fearful of the council, and fearful of the leaders, of the rulers of the synagogue, to understand that through the ministry of such people, even priests were now being converted, coming into the gospel almost unbelievable except that the word has preserved it on record for us acts chapter 6 and verse 7 and the word of god increased and the number of disciples multiplied in jerusalem greatly and a great number a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith understand it was very difficult for those priests to be saved more difficult than a catholic father getting saved today more difficult than a bigot a fanatical religious fellow getting saved today and yet when the power came upon them a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith if the giants here tonight will wake up the books that people will write will not be able to contain all the exploits that we can do. And I know it's going to happen. Because that's the promise of Jesus Christ. The works I do, ye shall do. Think about this. And then John said, all this were written down. That when you read, you might believe. Then he said, of all the things that Jesus did, if every sin were to be written down, then he said, all the books in the world could not contain them. And if Jesus said, the works I do, you as an individual will do, you as an individual will do, that one as an individual will do, if you bring all the works together, that the believers will do, the believers that believe the Lord, and that rise up as giants in the kingdom of God. If what Jesus did... All the books could not contain all that we're going to do together. The books of the world, the reporters of the world, will not be able to write everything. They'll just say, well, and many other similar things happen. We cannot put everything on paper. We need to write on other things. I believe it will happen. We can shake the campuses. We can move the campuses back to the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, who is going to do it? The fearful people. The ignorant people, the weak people, 
the seemingly foolish people the people that didn't think they could do it those are the people that will do it and by the grace of god we're going to be delivering the oppressed and we're going to reproduce the ministry of christ can you do it i said can you do it we're going to do it now point number three before we pray possession of satan's stronghold for our king possession of satan's stronghold for our king you know the attitude of some christian people today on the campuses the attitude is that i hope god will help me to keep the faith to myself i've entered this university i've entered this poly i've entered this college of education i've entered this uh, school of uh, nursing or school of medicine college of medicine i've entered this place with faith and i pray oh god that with all the things that are going on here you will keep me in the faith so that when i graduate i will still be called a christian they're not endeavoring to talk to anybody they're not endeavoring to win anyone to the lord they are not endeavoring to challenge the powers of darkness. They say, well, all I'm just praying for is that God will keep me in his grace and salvation until I come out. If God can do that for me, I'll be forever grateful. What are you going to do for the Lord? Nothing. Can't you possess Satan's stronghold for the king of kings? Can that be done? Those people never listen. Those people, they never want to hear that you mention the name of Jesus. I'm just keeping my faith to myself. Do you know that in the Bible, we find some wonderful and some interesting things. Let me show you some of them. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 12 and verse 13. And to the angel of the church in Pagamos write, These things says he, which has a sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest. He was talking to this man in charge of the church, the church in Pergamos. And he said, I know your works. I know where you are living. Where was he living? Even where Satan's siege is. Satan's siege was there. As the devil went up and down, to and fro in the world, he made that place his headquarters. All, he originated all the strategies of destruction in that place. And yet, this minister here was able to plant a church in that same place where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name. He was even faithful, declaring the name of the Lord. And also has not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful matter, which was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Even in that place where Satan was living, where Satan dwelt and where he made a seat and headquarters, there was a thriving church there. I believe we can have believers on every campus no matter how dark no matter how difficult no matter how apparently dangerous some people might say it is we can have christian witness on every campus and it is going to be so in jesus name now i want you to look at another example philippians chapter one philippians chapter one reading from verse 12 and verse 13 then we'll link it up with chapter 4, verse 22. Chapter 1, verse Philippians, verse 12. But I would, I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the parlors and in all other places. Paul the Apostle said, Do you know Philippians? You hear about my bonds, but the gospel is not bound. 
you hear that i've been taken from here to there and i appear before caesar and he called me to question but you know that it has so happened to the forderance of the gospel as he concluded the epistle see the people that greeted the church at philippi chapter 4 and verse 22 chapter 4 verse 22 all the saints salute you chiefly they that are of caesar's household caesar's household there are saints there they called me to question they were interrogating me looking at me as a criminal but then even as i appeared as a criminal in caesar's court some of his relatives saw and heard the gospel of the lord even the saints from caesar's house they are now greeting you if it can happen there it can happen anywhere and everywhere in first peter chapter 5 verse 13 first peter chapter 5 verse 13 the church that is at babylon elected together with you saluted you the church at babylon of all places babylon the very center of idol worship of occultism of the powers of darkness and the very center of magic and evil power it says the church that is at babylon elected together with you just like with you in ordinary normal places the church in babylon is also saluting you that's why we know we can take the strongholds of satan and bring them to our king that's what the lord has said every place the soul of your foot shall tread upon i've given it unto you that department people are there and they will know the lord on that campus the people there they will know the lord then it says and no man shall be able to stand before you as i was with moses so i will be with you fear not rise up and do it in psalm 2 verse 8 psalm 2 verse 8 and ask of me and i shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession if we can pray we will possess we'll preach the gospel and many will come to know the lord before we pray isaiah chapter 52 isaiah chapter 52 awake awake put on thy strength o zion put on thy beautiful garments o jerusalem the holy city for henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean shake thyself from the dust don't just lie down in defeat this despair or despondency shake thyself from the dust arise see thou o jerusalem loose thyself from thy bounds from thy bound from the bands of thy neck o captive daughter of zion and then in verse 7 how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings that publisheth peace, that bringeth the good tidings of good things, and that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. The Lord is calling us to arise and to shake ourselves from the dust. And if we're going to see that kind of result, and publish the glad tidings and preach the gospel and bring many to the lord verse 11 has to be true in our lives depart ye depart ye go ye out from thence touch not the unclean thing go ye out of the midst of her 
Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. If we will be obedient to the Lord, I will make sure that anything that is any form of uncleanness, everything is cleansed away by the blood of Jesus in our lives. We will not lie in the dust anymore. We will awake from our sleep. And when giants wake up, mighty things will be done for the glory of God and for the kingdom of God. And it is time for us. We have slept enough. We have exhibited weakness enough. It is now time to hold on to the promises of God and say that we can do what it says we can do. Let the weak say, I am strong. And in the strength of the Lord, move on and possess the strongholds of Satan for the King of Kings, for the Lord of Lords. Let's rise up. Talk to the Lord in prayer tonight. And let our weaknesses be changed unto strength. Remember the paradox of our identity. You might feel that you are like a lamb. You can be a lion. You may think you are the least in the kingdom. You can be greater than the greatest in the Old Testament. You may think you are just like a harmless wanderer. You can become a powerful warrior. Warrior on your knees. Warrior in prayer. You may think you have a weak appearance. You can become mighty and strong in ministry. You may feel like you are just like a worm. That anyone that can just crush and tread upon. You can become a sharp threshing instrument. Are you fearful today? You can become fiery and forceful. Do you appear foolish? You can be wise. And the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than the strongest of men. You think you're like a child? You can become a champion. And a captive can become a leader in a strange land. You can do it. You will do it. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise. Get ready to serve the Lord. Get ready to do exploits for the name and for the glory of God. We can do it. You can do it. Believe on the Lord. It's possible for our sisters. It's possible for our brothers. We can. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. A lot of land to be possessed. A lot of territories to be covered. A lot of great things to attempt. If you'll believe the Lord, all things are possible to him that believes. People who are weaker than yourself have accomplished much for the glory of God in the past. Now this is your time. On your campus, this is your time. In your area, this is your time. What did they have? They had the Spirit of God. You too can have the Spirit. Some of them received the double portion. You too can receive the double portion. Some of them received a greater anointing. You too can have a new anointing. They are Christ dwelling in them in all fullness. You too can have the fullness of Christ dwelling in you. You can. You can. In the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The labor of all church workers shall never be in vain. As our Father, the Father of all globally, the Covenant of GCK, Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumui gives us the Global Church Workers Conference live from Taraba State, Nigeria. All church workers and ministers globally to join hands with all ministers across Taraba State, Northern Nigeria from 17 to 20 November 2022. It's our time for triumphing in ministry, even in troublous times. Pastor Dr. W. F. Kui will be ministering 8 a.m. daily from Jalingo, Taraba State, to the world via satellites and all our social media platforms. It will be an avalanche of global expositions and revelations. Your labor will not be in vain.
When we started the year 2022, you had hopes, you had desires, you had dreams, but suddenly, all over the globe, we read and hear of failures economically, politically, with climate change and security breaches here and there. And now, I hear a voice echoing towards the northeastern geopolitical zone of Nigeria. Now, I hear a voice echoing towards the northeastern geopolitical zone of Nigeria. Today, the Lord is saying, weep not. All your tears are dried because behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed. And it's confirmed that there's still one hope, one way, one solution and one power that never fails. The power of Jesus Christ reverberates this November with GCK live from Adamawa State, Nigeria. The land of beauty set to beautify your life through Christ. As the covenant of GCK, Pastor Dr. W.F. Kumuyi will touch down in Adamawa, Nigeria with a power that never fails. Healing, deliverance, salvation. November 24 to 29, 2022. 1600 hours GMT daily and 0700 hours GMT for Sunday worship service. Young people from all levels will be empowered for excellence at the Impact Academy on November 26, 2022 at 0600 hours GMT. Ministers and professionals will be empowered for breakthrough in ministry on November 25, 26, 28 and 29 at 0600 hours GMT. Our guest gospel minister is Bob Feets. This is an avalanche of manifestation of the power that never fails. For all lie, power will herald your celebration. Dr. William Kumui says, Be it confirmed in your life in Jesus' name. GCK, the gospel to every creature.